morning. Can I hear anyone? Can you? Can you hear me okay? Oh yeah, I can. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our crisis response panel as part of Nami Mass's Advocacy Day. Um, we really appreciate all of you and your time. So it is 11, so we're going to get started. Um, at first, if you guys could just introduce yourselves, um, we can start with the order of how the panelists are going to go. So if Emily and Julie, you could go first, um, and then we'll go to Kelly, Becky, and with Vesper. Emily, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Emily Bailey. I'm the Chief of Behavioral Health for Mass Health. Hello, I'm Julie Hyam Shepherd, Assistant Commissioner for Mental Health Services at the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health. My pronouns are she, her, her. Hey, I'm Becky Mantso Barnett. I lead the Community Relations Team over at Massachusetts Behavioral Health Partnership, promoting the new Massachusetts Behavioral Health Helpline. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kelly Cunningham from the Department of Public Health, and I'm the Director of the Violence and Injury Prevention Unit. Good morning, all. My name is Vesper Moore. I use they, them pronouns, and I am the Chief Operating Officer at the Kiva Centers. And before we start, actually, if we could just give a high level of what all of you have done in crisis response over the last couple of years. Um, I know that's a lot to ask because we've all done so much and been so instrumental in the changes that have happened in Massachusetts, and we'll definitely dig into that with your presentations, um, but just how your role plays into crisis response. And so we'll start again with Emily. Sure. Mass Health um, is very invested in ensuring that crisis response is robust in the community. So um, in my role as the chief of um, the Office of Behavioral Health at Mass Health, we think about the needs of Mass Health individuals when it comes to crisis, especially thinking about what are better community pathways as alternatives to the emergency department when someone is having an issue um, or is suffering or needs urgent care, um, which is also something I'll be talking to you a little bit about later. Also in part of my role, I have the privilege to work with the other um, uh, divisions that are participating here today, the Department of Public Health, the Department of Mental Health, um, the um, Bureau of Addiction Services through DPH. We, we sort of are working together on a very regular basis to think not only about mass health individuals, which is my responsibility, but to think about everybody, all people in the Commonwealth and how they're thinking about, um, not how, how we as a system are thinking about responding to urgent and crisis needs when it comes to behavioral health. We have an infrastructure in the Commonwealth for physical health urgent care. We all know where to go if we need a stroke culture, a strep culture, for example, on a Saturday. But that's not the same for behavioral health. So we actually spend a lot of time thinking, I spend a lot of time thinking about mass health, but we as um, a, a, um, a government group think a lot of, think about quite often 
and, and um, strategize together, how can we continuously improve the experience and the infrastructure for crisis response in, in the Commonwealth? Thank you, uh, Julie. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for having us, by the way. Um, I'm new to the DMH, so um, this month I'm celebrating the year anniversary of DMH, so I can speak with you about, <laughs> thank you, I can speak with you about, you know, uh, what I have been doing so far, and specifically behavioral helpline, BHHL. So currently I'm leading the DMH help, behavioral helpline team. Mio Tamanaha is the DMH helpline director. And Anita Enjos is the helpline project manager, where DMH is key uh, point of contact for the helpline, ensuring collaboration with the helpline vendor, Massachusetts Behavioral Health Partnership, MBHP. Becky Barnett from MBHP is here, so we're excited to see you, Becky. So the Behavioral Health Helpline was recently launched in early January this year, and our team um, has been dedicated to its effective operations. So I'm here to talk with um, everyone more about the behavioral health helpline, which is a front door access to mental health and substance abuse treatment for everyone in Massachusetts. So I can go over more detail about the helpline after the introductions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Kelly? So I've had a, a unique journey. I started here as the division director for violence and injury prevention in the end of November. However, one of the programs that sits within the division is the suicide prevention program. And prior to being the division director, I was the director of the suicide prevention program for five years. I've actually worked in suicide prevention for 15, seven of which were at one of the local crisis centers that we have here in Massachusetts, and then eight here at DPH. And one of the big things that we did in the suicide prevention program is we have been the state lead for 988 here in the state of Massachusetts. So we um, have been working for quite some time to make sure that we had our centers that were up and running uh, prior to July 16th when 988 went live. We had worked hard at getting two of our centers that were not part of the Lifeline network as part of that network. We were able to increase um, the operating hours of all of the centers, so they would be 24 seven, because prior to that, only two of our centers were 24 seven. Um, but also too, there's been a lot of other work in the suicide prevention program that we've done, especially over the last five years in supporting a lot of the services that happen out in the community around suicide prevention and educating people on what that means and where to turn to for help when you, when you know somebody's in crisis. So that's been a big effort, but I would have to say in the past year, 988 really kind of took over a lot of the work that we have done here. Thank you. Becky? Well, I am even more new to my role than Julie is to her role. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm out of uh, Massachusetts Behavioral Health Partnerships, so of course, MBHP as a whole, our close partners uh, with, with, with MassHealth and with the state in, in many ways and many quarters and uh, committed to being a part of crisis response for the Commonwealth. Uh, but my role in particular uh, with supporting and promoting the new uh, Massachusetts Behavioral Health Helpline, uh, the, the role of my team is to make sure that uh, not only do we have services that are available to folks, but um, are they actually accessible to everybody in the Commonwealth? Uh, we could have uh, all kinds of services out there, but if nobody knows about them, it's it's not going to do a whole lot of good necessarily. Um, and I can share more about this when I get into the work of the community relations team. But that's really it in a nutshell, is making sure everybody knows about the helpline, knows about uh, the community behavioral health centers, knows about the array of, of services that are available to, to folks through the Massachusetts Behavioral Health Roadmap and uh, making sure that those services are not just available, but also truly accessible to every single person in the state. Thank you. And last but not least, Vesper. Absolutely. So, I mean, I've been doing peer support work for, I'd say, over a decade. And um, my role had started as a peer bridger, you know, and, and doing peer bridging work in inpatient settings. And, you know, in my own life, I, I am a person who, who, who had gone through a crisis and has been in the hospital. And 
I'd say that there's, there's so much in terms of community work and informing the community of what crisis response looks like in Massachusetts that Kiva Centers does. But in addition to that, we train certified peer specialists, the nearly 2000 that you know in the Commonwealth um, have been trained by the Kiva Centers. And we also have uh, two peer-run respites. Uh, these, these respites are a space where people can go when they are experiencing crisis, when they are struggling for five to seven days. And we also do um, mobile peer respite response. So we go to folks and we support them for 30 minutes to four hours at a time, um, multiple times out of the week when they need those resources. We also just started a peer support line recently, or I should say, um, re you know kind of reestablished our peer support line because we've had it in the past and um, that's been serving as an additional resource for a lot of folks as well great clearly we have a lot of expertise today which is so exciting um, but i'd really love to get started on your individual presentations if we could do that so if we could have um, julie and emily go first great thanks so i'm going to start so um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about something that we call the Behavioral Health Roadmap for Reform, because it's setting the stage for some of the things that we're, um, Julie and I are going to be talking to you about today, about um, some of the things that are newer that we're hoping people can take good advantage of and really help um, to change the um, experiences that people have had in the past when accessing community-based urgent or crisis treatment. So I'm just gonna start with a little bit of history on, on how the roadmap started. So um, there was a, a number of years in which people were asking the question, um, what can we do to um, improve the crisis system and the community-based system for behavioral health in the Commonwealth? Uh, and in 2019, there were multiple listening sessions. So the state um, engaged in multiple sessions uh, around the Commonwealth with you know, some expert support to listen which I just think is just a wonderful approach um, to take the ideas that, that we thought we had and really understand from people that were consumers of the services, providers providing the services, advocates, stakeholders, what do we need to know as, before we start on any reform efforts? So more than um, almost 700 people, not more than almost 700 people participated in these listening sessions. And I will share the summary points that came out of those listening sessions that became the foundation for what is now referred to as the Behavioral Health Roadmap, which is really looking to support crisis services as well as a, a multiple other things, but really to support crisis services that we're going to talk to you more in detail about today. So what the listening sessions found were that too many people struggle to find the right type of behavioral health treatment and um, also a provider that accepts your insurance. So um, uh, knowing what letters after the person's name, endless lists of individuals, um, not knowing what type of professional that you need, layer on any linguistic or preferences that you have, linguistic needs or preferences if you have gender, race, ethnicity preferences um, or needs, and then layer on trying to sort through the insurance treatment. It's incredibly complicated. So that was one thing that was heard loud and clear and was number one um, from the listening sessions. Next, too often, hospital emergency rooms are the entry point. So if people were unable to access treatment in the community before things got really bad, and people are home suffering or in their community suffering and things get really bad, there's nowhere else to go but the ER. We all know where that is, right? So that was something else that we said, okay, this is something else important for us to know. The next point is individuals often could not get mental health and addictions treatment in the same spot, even though they very often happen together. Finally, culturally competent behavioral health care for racial, racially, ethnically, and linguistically diverse communities can be difficult to find. Um, so those were the primary four foundational um, learnings that came out of the roadmap uh, listening sessions. And of course, these longstanding challenges were and are only exacerbated by the pandemic that we've all been experiencing and the impact that that's had on all of us, especially children. So taking those learnings and thinking about what could we do from a policy perspective to help improve some of those challenges that were outlined. We set out, we, the collective, we, multiple people on the screen, multiple agencies, set out to think about how do we formulate a front door? Julie and Becky are both gonna to talk to you about this, but how do we think about a front door that's not the emergency room? How do we think about a place where people can enter and not need to know what letters you need after your name or what type of treatment that you need or 
figure out the really com um, complex world of insurance when somebody's suffering. So how can you figure out that first step? We wanted to increase community-based care. So we wanted to figure out how to get people treatment, easy, predictable, convenient treatment in the community quicker. And we want to improve member experience and treatment options. So how can we expand options for crisis stabilization in the community? How can we expand options for um, discharge planning and more handoffs from the emergency department if that is where somebody presents? So we're going to talk to you a little bit more today about community behavioral health centers uh, and behavioral health urgent care centers and the behavioral health helpline. Um, I think with that, I'll hand it over to Julie because um, really talking about the behavioral health helpline as the front door to, to some of the new system is really the next thing to talk about. Thank you, Emily. So Emily summarized really well about what we found from the discussion with our community stakeholder. So we know that far too many Massachusetts residents have struggled to find the right type of mental health and also substance use care. So all too often, uh, our community member ended up going to emergency room to have been, uh, that has been the first place to find the services. And individualized and culturally competent mental health services have been difficult to find. So now because of Massachusetts um, new roadmap for mental health and substance use um, care, uh, which Emily mentioned, there are two new ways for our community members to receive the care they need. So the one is behavioral helpline, that which I'm going to go over, and then the other is community uh, CBH, is community behavioral health center. Um, the Massachusetts behavioral health helpline provides real um, time live support, which is really amazing, including clinical assessment and direct connection to mental health and substance use treatment. The helpline is open 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and available in over 200 languages. Any community members can call, text, or chat via the helpline website and get connected directly to the help people need. Um, I would like to highlight it again. Um, we have over 200 languages and 24, 7, and 365 days. The Bieva Health Helpline is non-insurance-driven services. Therefore, any community members can call for free. Um, so we are very excited to serve all Massachusetts residents um, anytime as needed. And the typically the caller's journey, I'm just going to just briefly explain to you. So we have helpline teams available. I, I just said before that 24 um, seven, and especially our frontline call operators um, is resource and referral specialist. So let's say caller contacted the helpline, our resource and referral specialist will receive a call, and then there is going to be brief assessment, screening um, process and assessment, and they're gonna decide which would it be the, what would it be the next follow-up, uh, what would it be the next services, appropriate services for the caller. And then um, there's going to be very busy uh, referral process, and this is going to be very rapid and you know quick. During that call, uh, let's say again, the community uh, member called the helpline, and then we're going to decide what would be the best services. And then we're going to have a warm handoff. So warm handoffs are the one that our um, resource and referral specialist contact to the next behavioral health provider directly. And then the referral resource specialist will provide all the intake information, any clinical information that they gather for the client. So that next provider have already have all the information. That being said, our caller don't really need to repeat the information over and over again. I think that's one of the things that some at times a community member feeling a burden and then feeling tired because they have to repeat the story over and over again. So our helpline uh, referral and resource specialist will do the work with our caller. So there is going to be warm hand up. Uh, once the referral is made, or even before the referral is made, um, our re referral and resource specialist will do follow up call prior to the intake, but also after the intake. So we want to ensure that our caller get the right services right away, but also we want to make sure that the uh, the behavioral health referral that we made are working really well for our caller. So that's typically our um, helpline journey. Thank you. 
Great, thanks, Julie. So the helpline is part of a continuum of services that were developed under the roadmap. So the helpline went live in January. So it's live all the time now. And we have a slide at the end for you with um, information from 988 and the helpline and what I'm gonna tell you about community behavioral health centers. And um, Becky probably also has some information that's for me too, but we'll, we'll give you a slide with like web links and phone numbers and stuff at the end. So the helpline is 24 seven. You don't need to know what you don't know and you can get connected into treatment. Part of getting connected into treatment was making sure that there was a place to connect into treatment consistently and predictably. And that is the next part of the behavioral health roadmap is called community behavioral health centers. There are 25 community behavioral health centers in the Commonwealth now. They have been designated sites. Some people may be familiar with a federal designation of CCBHCs. It's a little different than that. So um, it's not really important, except if you do know about that, it can be a little confusing because we use the same letters. Community Behavioral Health Centers, the goal of Community Behavioral Health Centers is to have 25 consistent, predictable, site-based locations that people in communities know where they are. That uh, every town and city is served by one of the Community Behavioral Health Centers. Individuals can go to any of them though, if you prefer a particular provider that um, services another area, that any individual can go there. The important parts to know about Community Behavioral Health Centers is that they're open seven days a week, during the weekdays, they're open eight to eight. So that was really important to us. They need to be open longer and more accessible. They have requirements about getting people in sooner. So they will often take calls from the behavioral health helpline to schedule people appointments within a couple of days, sometimes up to 14 days um, if it's a non-urgent situation. So essentially you can contact community behavioral health center, you speak with someone, and you are essentially triaged. Someone will speak to you to determine, is this a crisis? Is this an urgent matter? Is this a medication matter? Or is this a more routine matter? And we use the word routine. It means that it's not something that needs to be addressed within the next day or two. Now, the key pieces of crisis related to the community behavioral health centers are as follows. The community behavioral health centers now are responsible for the mobile crisis intervention teams. In the past, we used to call these teams ESPs, emergency service providers. So now since January, mobile crisis intervention for adults and youth, separate teams, different training, um, are operated out of the community behavioral health centers. A key difference from um, those of you who may have experienced the system before January is that the mobile crisis intervention teams or previously ESPs used to be primarily um, mobile. One of the aspects of the community behavioral health center that's really um, a critical important part is that these sites actually have staff, separate waiting rooms for kids and adults, drop off locations for first responders and police and are, are open. So there's also a place to go. Sometimes you can make a phone call, sometimes you need to go somewhere. So there's somewhere to go where there are licensed clinicians um, and, a, and a, a clinical infrastructure supporting the Community Behavioral Health Center that houses the mobile crisis intervention teams. Those teams can also be deployed mobily from calling the helpline or calling the CBHCs directly or calling a 1-800 number that's been around forever that Becky, I think you could probably talk more about, but they're, um, you know, they're, this is sort of the seamless way to get that mobile crisis. So those are things that are in existence now. Community behavioral health centers have also expanded their community crisis stabilization beds, 24 hour staff secure levels of care for those individuals who require stabilization in a staff secure location, but do not require an emergency, uh, sorry, an inpatient psychiatric unit. These beds are available currently at all community behavioral health centers. The beds are um, 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 being still for adults are widely available for youth. They are continuously being built. We will see more and more beds come online this year for younger kids and older kids separated differently from the different programs from adults to actually support people either seen in the community behavioral health crisis center mobily, so a crisis team going out to home, school, 
nursing facility other location um, that determines that a person would benefit from this level of care or or really any level of care. There's no sort of um, gate, it, you know, the person needs to be determined by a, a, an appropriate clinician that that's, the, that's what they need, but those services are available and will become more available throughout this year as we continue to build this out. Um, community behavioral health centers, crisis services are available to everyone. So crisis intervention, mobile crisis intervention, or walking in for an emergency crisis assessment at a community behavioral health center is not dependent on your insurance or ability to pay. That's really important. So whether you call the helpline and have mobile crisis come to you, you don't have to worry about insurance or ability to pay, or you call your community behavioral center, you walk in, you don't have to worry about your ability to pay. Now, follow-up services, the community behavioral health center is gonna help you um, figure out what services are covered by your insurance, or if you don't have insurance, how do, how do we connect you with the right services to treat your needs? But that initial crisis situation, intervention and stabilization um, is being funded through, through multiple pathways to make sure that it's accessible to everybody. Uh, one last thing about the community behavioral health centers, they're not just crisis and you know therapy and meds. They also have group therapy, there's peers, there's care coordinators, there's nurses, um, there's security guards. They're really intended to be, and the only reason I bring that up is to make sure that um, um, people feel safe and secure in, in the environment if there were um, 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 a visit at three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. There's, there's a safe, secure environment there. Uh, for people to go. Um, they also are um, offering clinical services, um, evidence-based practice clinical services. Uh, they uh, are attesting and signing off to excellence in training for their staff. Um, so these, this is really comprehensive behavioral health services located in the community, including treatment for addictions and substance use disorders. I wanted to share one more thing before I pass the mic over to the rest of our panelists. Um, is now this is just a mass health program. What I'm about to describe to you is just a mass health program. It's called behavioral health urgent care. Um, behavioral health urgent care is essentially designations that we at mass health give to community mental health centers, um, which there are a couple hundred in the state. And these are generally the big clinics that you would think about and certainly can provide a, a resource to, to figure out who and where they are. Um, but on our website, you're gonna get the webpage at the end of this. They're all listed there. You can put in your zip code and it'll spit out the community behavioral health center and the urgent care center and all kinds of printable information on the helpline is all going to be available for you uh, on those links. Behavioral health urgent care are community mental health centers that have um, uh, worked through flexibility and scheduling to get people in faster. So similar to how I described the CBHC, Behavioral health urgent care centers are open longer hours, not as long as the community behavioral health centers, but are open some weekend and some evening hours. And community behavioral health, excuse me, behavioral health urgent care mental health centers have the similar process where you contact them, you talk to somebody, they assess the need. And if the need is urgent, they will work to get that initial intake appointment done within a couple of days. So that's community behavioral health center. Oh, my gosh, sorry. That is behavioral health urgent care centers. Um, now we're continuously growing and working with our mental health agencies to continue to add more capability into the Commonwealth. Right now there are about 55 sites that are able to do this. So again, these are resources that are available. We'll make the, um, the information available to you at the end of this session. And I'm sure our friends at NAMI will send out the information so you all can um, have it accessible and available to you. Thank you. Great, Emily and Julie, thank you so much. And as Emily mentioned, we do have that slide. So at the end of um, these presentations and the Q&A that we're going to do, um, we will provide this slide on the screen so you can copy down the information and we will also be providing a link for you to fill out a questionnaire. So if you have any questions, Amanda and I will be able to send them to any of the panelists today. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to Kelly. Thank you. So I'm gonna focus on 988 and gonna give you a little background information in what we've done over the past year and, and exactly what our, our centers actually do here. <clears throat> so 
Um, in November of 2020, federal legislation was passed creating 988 as the dedicated three digit number for callers looking for mental health and suicidal support. For most people, this would be the 10 digit 1-800-273-8255 number that is now available also as 988. And I say also because that 10 digit number has not gone away, but they wanted a number to make it easier for people to remember when they are in crisis. And this number is available also as text or chat. Those that could be, uh, the centers that could answer the calls for 988 must also be members of the Lifeline Network. In Massachusetts, we have five centers who are part of that network. Uh, they are Call to Talk, which is out of Mass 211, Samaritans Inc. here in Boston, Samaritans of Cape Cod in the Islands, Samaritans of Merrimack Valley, which is part of Family um, Services of Merrimack Valley, and Samaritan South Coast. It's important to remember that the five centers have been answering these types of calls for close to 50 years. That's for several of them. So this is not something new to them. They've been doing this for a long time. This isn't a, oh no, we have to start up this new system. They've already been doing this. And in fact, just a, a little interesting piece of this information, Massachusetts is on target for this particular fiscal year to answer over 350,000 calls from individuals who are looking for emotional, compassionate, non-judgmental support. Only 20% of those calls are actually from 988. Now we do expect to see this number to change over time as more people become more aware of 988, but there are a lot of folks that just feel comfortable with the numbers, these local numbers, because they know they're gonna get directly to that site. And speaking of which, I think it's important to give a little description of what happens when a person calls 988. So 988 is actually at a national hub. All right, so you call 988, you go to this national hub and they'll ask you some questions. Uh, veteran press one, Spanish speaking press two, LGBTQ plus youth and you can press three. If you are not looking for one of those services, it will then route you to a local center based on your area code. Now, remember, this is important. This is not geolocation. This is by area code. So if you are, say, a student here in Massachusetts, but you're from California and you call 988, your call is going to get routed to California. This is not something that we can handle at the local level. It's something that actually at the national level they're trying to work out so that people can access within the state of where they are in crisis. But until that happens, just know that any center that you go to has certain trainings, accreditation, um, standards that they must follow to be part of the network. And that's incredibly important. One thing that is part of that is that every caller is provided a suicide risk assessment. That's to check for their desire and intent and capability of suicidality. But not everybody who calls is suicidal. Most people who call are just looking for emotional support. And this is where 988 differs from the behavioral health helpline. It's non-clinical support. They're there uh, to be able to be in an emotional support in that moment for that individual. In fact, most people that call 988 already have a provider of their own, but they need something that will carry them over during that time in between, as opposed to people who call the Behavioral Health Helpline who might be looking for a provider. So a little bit different. And again, non-clinical support when you're calling 988. When a risk assessment is done on a suicidal person, on, on a person in crisis, if they are deemed as being suicidal, uh, one of the requirements for being part of the network is if a person is an imminent risk, this means that they've either started an attempt or will be very soon. That's when emergency service is brought in. So that might be when we call 988. This is another important distinction. A lot of people heard 988 and they heard it in the realm of 988 is the mental health number for, you know, compared to 911. And it made people think that if they call 988, 911 is automatically going to be involved and police and ambulance and fire are gonna be at their door. Misconception, misinformation that we're really trying to help people understand is not the case. The only time emergency services is called is if this person is in an emotional, at that point of, we know that they need medical assistance and that's when they will call. 
Otherwise, if a person is, maybe they are feeling suicidal and they need more support and it's beyond the emotional support they're getting at that moment, we now have the capability to provide a warm handoff to the mobile crisis intervention that Emily was talking about. So this is just another way to provide additional services for people. So we're making sure that they have those connections and those links in to mobile crisis, to the behavioral health helpline, to the CBHCs. So this, I, I do believe that we're creating this wonderful system in Massachusetts that provides a person someone to talk to, someone to respond, and a place to go, which is really the vision for 988. Um, again, you do not have to be suicidal <clears throat> to, call nine, to call 988. And just to give you a little bit more details on some of those figures, 98% of the calls are resolved at the center level. And only about 1% received a warm transfer to the emergency service program, and less than half a percentage which is like 0.14, involves a request for a safety check for 911. So when I said emergency service program, that was the ESP that Emily was talking about, which is really now mobile crisis. So we're, we're changing our language too. And remember, we've been doing this now since July. So we're making these changes in January and, and as we move forward uh, with the new behavioral health line that's up now. Um, Prior to 988, the Massachusetts centers were primarily staffed by volunteers. Uh, this, another thing is very unique. You know, you've got to imagine these are people that just want to support and, and help individuals who are in crisis and need. Since 988, one of the things, thanks to some state funding as well as federal funding, a federal grant, we have been able to provide a significant amount of money to these five centers to be able to have now a hybrid workforce model. So they have a number of staff. In fact, it increased by like 138% their, um, their staff FTEs. So now this allows them to be 24 seven. It allows them to have um, the ability to have multiple staff, which does help decrease burnout, which is very common for people who do this type of work. And while there has been a significant growth at the staffing front. The staffs are the centers are still not fully staffed. One of the things that we are really learning over this past year is where are more calls coming in? What time of day? What days of the week? And those would be times that a staff might need to or a center might need to staff up more. So they are learning through trial and error, unfortunately. You know, that's the only way that you can do this. There's no predictability to say that we know every night at 11 o'clock we're going to have more callers. That, is, that does happen quite a bit, and a lot of the centers have taken that into action. But there might be times of the year where we see a little spike in the calls that happen. So this, the centers are learning to be able to adjust their staffing based on the needs of the callers. Um, something else just to, to kind of close this out is I want you to understand when a person calls 988 and they get to that local center, if that center is not able to call, we have in-state backup centers to be able to answer. If they cannot answer, it does go out to the national backup center. So that is, you know, we're doing everything in our power to make sure that all calls are answered here within the Commonwealth so that our residents can get the treatment and the support and that emotional support that they need at their time of their call. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, and again, just as a reminder, we will have a square that you can download that will take you to a form to ask any questions for any participants of the panel after the panels are over. Um, so now we're going to transition to Becky. Wow, just listening to all of you, I am proud all over again to be a resident of Massachusetts and just so thankful. Uh, my goodness for all of the um, services and resources that are that are available. Um, and, I, and I guess I would say that um, as it is, I think probably for most, if not all of us, this is this is personal, right? These this this care that we're um, trying to offer through 988, through the behavioral health helpline, through the CBHCs and the BHUCs. It's about helping uh, real people with real stories, with real uh, hurts and fears and hopes and needs and dreams. And um, I'm just so glad and thankful uh, to be a part of this work with you all and really with all of the NAMI constituency who are who are so invested in getting um, folks the care and help when and where they need it. 
So as I mentioned before, um, my team is specifically connected to uh, the Massachusetts Behavioral Health Helpline a community relations team, which what does that even mean, right? It's a, it's a term we hear a lot. And on one level, uh, what uh, my team and, and myself, what we're tasked with doing, as I said before, it's about promotion, right? Getting the word out there just so everybody knows that the, that the behavioral health helpline exists and, of course, the services that are connected to it, which Emily talked about. Um, but for me, it's, it's deeper than that, that it, it really is about human connection, um, a, a person um, might call a phone number they see on a billboard, and uh, we're excited that you are going to see the, the helpline number on billboards coming up starting the end of this month and into May, uh, that we're going to have a, a widespread marketing campaign to make sure as many people as possible hear about these, these available resources. Um, but we also know that not everybody is going to make a phone call just because they saw a number on a billboard. Uh, for a lot of folks, it takes some kind of personal connection that somebody I know and somebody I trust told me about this resource and told me that it's not just for those people out there, but it's for, for me um, and, and uh, for who I am and where I'm coming from and my particular needs. Uh, so that, that's really the work that, that my team is about. There, we have a team of 10 uh, community relations representatives, and I'm going to go ahead uh, and, and show you a picture if I could, so that you know that uh, these are real actual people out there in the community um, who you can connect with. My apologies, I'm not sure what's going on here. We'll just leave it like that. These are real actual people out in the community who uh, want to connect with you, who want to connect with the work you're doing around behavioral health, and to be a part of making sure that folks know about the helpline and, uh, and have access to it. And what our team is doing, what our representatives are doing, are kind of two things on two different levels. Uh, we have a broad canvas going on where our representatives are reaching out to individual schools, to police departments, firehouses, uh, faith communities, advocacy groups, food pantries, shelters, uh, veterinarians office, actually, we're finding that a lot of veterinarians are really eager and glad to get information about the BHHL, about the Behavioral Health Helpline, as they encounter folks all the time who are grieving, say, the loss, the loss of a pet and who are looking for uh, mental health support with that. So our team is doing this broad canvas where we're emailing people, we're making phone calls, we're uh, just stopping by uh, to, to different community centers to uh, share promotional materials to, to say, hey, do you know about the helpline? Can I, about the behavioral health helpline, can I tell you about it? Uh, but what we're also doing is showing up at targeted events uh, because our goal here is to make sure that anybody and everybody in the Commonwealth knows about the behavioral health helpline, but also we want to make um, especially sure that historically underserved uh, populations, demographics throughout the Commonwealth, learn about the helpline and um, uh, have a sense of th th that this resource is for me. So some of the events that we're showing up at just to get connected to people. Again, it's all about this, these, these personal connections um, and to represent the helpline. Showing up at things like, uh, I think it was just last week, Newton Wellesley Hospital and the Waltham Public Schools had an immigrant health and wellness fair. Uh, so we had representatives who were there and a part of that sharing BHHL information. We had uh, representatives at uh, the Central Mass Legislative Breakfast on Health Equity. Uh, and th this one I love in particular, a factory out in Western Mass, uh, when our representatives stopped by and told them about the helpline, they're like, oh my goodness, we have uh, close to a thousand employees here. Would you set up a table in our break room and just be around uh, during, during the work day, during set hours, to share information about the helpline with our employees. So, uh, you know, uh, close to a thousand, um, mainly BIPOC uh, workers at this factory out in Western Mass had the opportunity uh, to come through during their break and to learn, to learn about the helpline. And to uh, maybe show you some pictures here. I'm so sorry, I'm trying to make it big for you. Uh, of some places where we've been and what we're doing. Uh, some of our reps met the mayor of Lemonster at a, at a community event, and he invited them to come on his weekly talk show on Lemonster Live TV to share about the BHHL. Um, it's been wonderful to 
uh, to work with our state partners in getting out there to spread the word about the BHHL. We are so glad to do that with Commissioner Doyle at a, a New Bedford Board of Health Conference on Homelessness early, earlier this year. Of course, one of uh, the populations that we're making sure to reach out to are veterans. And one of our representatives, Gail Cavanaugh McAuliffe, is herself a veteran. And so uh, she's been presenting at all kinds of veterans related uh, conferences and events. Uh, and in the bottom right there, you see a picture of uh, one of our Boston reps who she was just out and decided she should stop by the mayor's office and make sure Boston Mayor Michelle Wu knew about the Paveral Health Helpline. And uh, Mayor Wu was, was delighted to receive that, that information. So some key partnerships for us. Well, uh, one of those is with uh, police, local police departments. As Emily said earlier, one of the goals of the Behavioral Health Roadmap is to um, keep folks out of the ED if that's not really the appropriate place for them with, the, with their particular set of needs, and also to avoid unnecessary, unnecessary calls to 911 or visits from the police. And uh, it was so, it's so exciting to hear how the Worcester Police Department is themselves trying to get out ahead of this and going in on weekly rounds out in the community to find folks who are experiencing homelessness and to connect them to needed services. So now we have one of our uh, behavioral health helpline representatives who is uh, joining the Worcester Police on some of these weekly rounds to be able to share in real time ab about the helpline and about the CBHC's resources that are available to anyone and everyone. Another way that our team has been able to connect in the community is through um, uh, targeted outreach when there's some kind of a, of a crisis, which we know happens on the regular. So after a fire at Signature Brockton Hospital earlier this year, when suddenly other uh, local emergency departments were overwhelmed, what our team was able to do was to get out there in the community with really targeted efforts to try to get upstream to tell people about the BHHL so that if a mental health crisis arose, they could call the BHHL rather than go into one of the overwhelmed emergency departments. Uh, so it was really uh, beautiful to see what we can do when we're working together. In just over two weeks, our team was able to reach out to over 250 schools and local state agencies, first responders. Uh, and uh, when two of our representatives went into a local uh, immigrant legal services center in the Brockton area, and uh, the representative there after after our our folks shared about the BHHL. She said, oh my goodness, I just got off the phone with a client who is desperate for mental health support. I'm going to call her back right now and, uh, and give her this phone number. Uh, another example of just really meaningful connections we've been able to make, again, all, uh, all to the end of getting the information about the resources that are available into the hands of the people who need them. Uh, recently, one of our representatives pre presented on the helpline to at, at the Nuevo Dia Adult Daycare Center in Roxbury, um, and, and a grandmother, Spanish-speaking grandmother who, who immigrated to the U.S. earlier in her life. She shared, you know, I have struggled my entire life. I've never gotten the help I needed, but I'm going to call the BHHL today, and I'm, and I'm going to get the help I need for myself and for my children and, uh, and for my grandchildren. So again, uh, our team's work, it's around sort of a, a, meta, uh, a meta effort at canvassing the whole community so that um, anybody and everybody knows about the helpline, but it's also about individual people, individual stories, um, individual lives that are changed because they are able to have the opportunity to find out about the resources that are available to them and to then to reach out and um, get life-changing help uh, when and where they need it. So our team is so thankful uh, to, as I tell everybody, our team has the best job. Uh, you all are doing the hard work for providing these services, and we're getting to tell people about them. And uh, just, you know, to, to everybody here present, uh, we are, my team, and I would love to connect with you as we partner in that work of, of getting the word out. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Becky. And, um, you know, if it's okay, I think it'd be great if we could share that slide as well with individuals. Um, we can email it to anyone who registered. And if you have any questions or you want that information, you can email Amanda and I at a later time. Um, great, so we're going to move on to um, Vesper. It's been so uh, wonderful hearing about all of these different resources throughout the Commonwealth. Um, you know, Kiva Centers, we 
we really emerged from a mental patients rights movement, from the civil rights movement. And that's a really important starting point. The reason why I say that is because when we think about a health equity response and we think about what health equity means, life experience is central to that. Um, and we also think about, you know, on a policy level, when, when, when we help other uh, government agencies or, you know, um, medical institutions or, or other spaces really inform what these services could look like, we always emphasize the importance of life experience, not just um, as a form of input, but in the inception, the creation and the design of something, right? And it's, it, it's, been, it's been important, you know, when, how, when we think about, you know, all of these, these new and exciting services that, that there has been such a concentration on, well, what's the role of peer support? What's the role of life experience? So a lot of these certified peer specialists that are at the community behavioral health centers are, you know, trained through us. And the, the, the essential nature of the certified peer specialist training is, is that we have three core competencies. Um, one core competency is being a change agent, um, focusing on the role of advocacy, social change, um, what, what we need to do almost as a, as a way of continuing continuously checking that, that, that a lot of these things are both self-determined and accessible to folks in the Commonwealth, right? Um, and accessibility has been a central role when we've been thinking about the roadmap, when we've been thinking about the implementation of a lot of these things. So then, um, you know, in, in addition to that, we have peer support, um, the role of peer support, mutual relationships. Um, and, and, and we also emphasize the role that, that when someone is in an employed role, there's, there's a difference in power inherently, and there's a difference in, in things that we have to follow. So we focus on transparency first and a reciprocal relationship and understanding the role of that, right? Um, and then we also focus on the role of in but not of the system and the, the truth of the matter is, is really being um, embedded in the community. That brings us to, to, to the next part of the Kiva centers, which is our recovery learning communities. We have multiple Kiva centers. Kiva is a Hopi Zuni term that means to go deep within yourself and come out healing yourself. It is a metaphor for self-determination and self-determines path to healing and however someone may define it. Uh, we also talk a lot about the, the, the idea of self-directed recovery and recovery approaches. So our recovery learning community is the, you know, is throughout central masses within hundred cities and towns. We have a few different centers. We have one, uh, but, but our, our key centers are in Worcester and in Southbridge. Um, one to be kind of as close to the center of the state as possible, right? And another to, to, to be in the South County area, which is a primarily Spanish speaking Hispanic community, right? Um, I, think, I think when we talk about you know, Kiva as like a health social movement organization, peer support movement organization. Um, informing health equity approaches have, have, have been really important. Um, you know, we have uh, folks on our team who are part of the 988 commission to really, you know, help inform and, and see what that approach looks like. I myself am on the special commission for state institutions in a separate role and appointed role. And a lot of that work um, encompasses how, how are we looking at current approaches and historical approaches when we've considered the role of community behavioral health. We've done so much in terms of being in the community and the right to an individual to live and have services in the community. Um, I think along with that, that brings in our uh, peer respite, which is a crisis alternative. Um, these are crisis alternative respites run by peers um, that, that serve in both a mobile capacity and in an in-person on-site capacity. And we have those peer respites. We, we, we have one in Worcester and another in Bellingham, which is a very, very rural area um, and, and, and a, a very, very much needed area um, in terms of reaching folks in Massachusetts. Rural mental health is a central part of Kiva Center's approach as well, because more often than not, you have families and individuals who do not have the resources they, they need out there. Or if there are resources nearby, they're, they're often unattainable. Which brings me to another point. We sponsor five community fridges 
um, that are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to individuals in the community who, who need food. They are governed by the community, they are sponsored by different community organizations, and we we go to these different locations and we fill these refrigerators to make sure folks in the community are fed, that they have access to food because they can't really engage in the service if they're hungry, if they're struggling. So for us, that's, that's a key essential role. We are also uh, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration's designated Massachusetts statewide consumer network. We refer to ourselves as Massachusetts statewide peer network. Um, and you know our training and, and our community connection with other life experience professions as we look at the larger um, expansion of health equity approach in, in the Commonwealth, that's an essential part of it as well. So, so I think when we think about the role of Kiva centers, often we are we we are informing the community as well as families about what these services look like, and we are also offering a peer-run approach for someone who who needs that personal connection. Um, our peer support line is available Monday through Friday, um, 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. Um, we have seen folks both in Massachusetts and kind of beyond Massachusetts. We didn't really cap it within the Commonwealth upon implementation. We were like, here's a phone number. Let's see where it goes. We do get a majority of folks in Massachusetts, but we also get folks in different parts of New England who, 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 who don't have some of those available resources immediately. Um, Kiva Centers, we are also a recognized um, TA, technical assistance entity through MassHealth District, and we also do a lot of technical assistance work um, throughout the country. And I think, I, I, I think one of the, the key roles there is really folks are trying to think about best practices for peer support, best practices for peer specialists, best practices for life experience for professions as a whole. Um, and what we found is, is that, is that yes, there's, there's a role of, of what life experience and implementation can, can actually look like, but, but also there needs to be a quality in the type of connection and the ethics and the approach in the work. So for us, um, advocacy is central to our work, but also understanding the role and the essential nature of what does it look like when someone is connecting with you and they're like, well, you know, I might have not gone exactly through what you have gone through, but I've gone through something similar and this is what that looked like, you know. Or when we think about how environments matter, you know, the idea that that the, the presence of positive messages isn't more important necessarily than the absence of negative messages. So if you have one sign that says, that says, oh, have a great day, have a wonderful day, and another sign that says, don't steal the food, don't, don't, don't do this, right? And they're next to each other, it impacts the messaging of a space and what something looks like in the approach. And I think, you know, we talk about that in environment mattering, but we also talk about that in terms of language and approach for peer specialists specifically. We follow a human experience language approach that is non-clinical everyday connecting language. Um, and that's the role of mutuality and transparency and being able to, to really engage in that way. Uh, another, another piece of our Kiva centers as well is, is that we are doing a lot of continuing education for certified peer specialists. We have a peer trauma guide training that is three days long and talks about the role of trauma and life experience. And how do you support someone after a traumatic event? We talk about trauma bonding, the role of trauma bonding and our relationships and what those things look like. We talk about um, the impact in our everyday life. Most of the calls that we get on our peer support line are due to isolation struggles in everyday relationships. A lot of these things that we see, right? And you know, some people might be struggling with suicide and may need another resource or will engage with another resource like Kiva or another organization. Um, but often when, when we are on these calls, a lot of the, the, the resources that people need is like someone who, who they can talk to after a long work day or someone that, that they can connect with when they are leaving you know a long-term relationship or or a housing situation that they've been in for a long time and i think i think contextualizing life experience contextualizing crisis and understanding emotional distress and these approaches has been crucial um, 
for us, the, especially the, these last three and a half years, but even prior to that. So, so I think, I think the, the encouragement of really um, exploring self-determination, but also community-led efforts and what the role of life experience looks like in a health equity approach um, is something that, that we've been concentrating on more and more. We also do a lot of trainings with the Massachusetts Behavioral Health Partnership. We, we're very glad to have that partnership and work with, 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 with y'all on, on, on many other pieces, whether if that's like, this is what the role of a certified peer specialist looks like, or, or this is what ge gender affirming care looks like in different settings, right? Or this is what an in, in, in anti-racist or racial justice approach can look like in, in these spaces. And I think, I think that that's been, been crucial as we've been seeing a reckoning in our society in a lot of ways around what, what this has looked like. You know, um, family members have been lost, loved ones have been lost. We've seen um, the impact of inequitable resources in the Commonwealth, especially emerging from a three-year emergency, right? So, um, and with that, you know, Kiva Centers, we concentrate on the social model of disability and a social model of trauma, meaning there's nothing wrong with your body or your mind as you are, but rather your society, your environments, your services need to be accessible to you. Um, we also focus on a social model of trauma, which is really reframing this idea that there's something inherently wrong with you. Instead, that something has happened to you, that, that, that it is very likely that something has happened to you that, that has informed this experience, right? Um, I, I think these have been crucial really to our trauma responsive, trauma informed approach. And, and, and with that, uh, we've really learned as a community together through our community gatherings, through our peer support groups, through different listening sessions in the community, through different ideas of, of, of what does the community need? What is the community looking for? And something that uh, I've noticed as a theme during this panel, as we've been talking as well, is this idea of local resources are an essential, an essential when, when we consider, you know, folks in, in, in crisis where they are and what they're looking for. I mean, that is at the center of a lot of the implementation of these support lines, right, is the idea that, that someone may have a resource that they may, may be looking for. If someone has immigrated from another country and they're looking for a resource, that that can support them with with getting their green card or 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 getting housing or finding work or finding a lot of these different things it's going to take local resources to really engage and work with that person so kiva centers as an organization that centers life experience that is embedded and doing a lot of the groundwork in many different communities we come together and we really inform what a health equity approach looks like that can be guided and led by life experience and self-determination for the community at large. Great, thank you so much. And, you know, just an overall thank you to everyone who's been on this panel today. Um, we're going to transition to some questions, but I think the background information and really laying the, the work for um, where we are going and all of the changes that have been happening in crisis over the last year or so um, was very helpful and informative. And so our first question is, with the opening of the Behavioral Health Helpline 988 and the CBHCs, it's clear Mass has taken steps to improve crisis response. What changes have you seen in the overall system and what do you think has worked well? And I welcome anyone to respond. <laughs> so I, I can start. Um, I think that what you heard and the commitment of the people on this panel and the people that, that we work for and represent us and the commitment to, to changing the crisis experience and really ensuring that there is a very robust uh, crisis continuum that is available that is not only accessible through the emergency department is a top priority. So um, I think that, I'll, albeit still very new, um, only being in place since January, um, really, really worth being excited about the future. Uh, and um, hopefully, 
um, individual by individual that needs the services will come to um, change the, the paradigm um, of, of struggling or having troubles trying to get into services, access medications, um, find an alternative to the emergency department where that's appropriate. Uh, so I think that I think that the changes that you, some of the changes that we've described here today are really exciting. Um, also, the additional and Kelly can certainly speak more about this, but the additional um, focus and um, community um, education around 988 has just brought forward the idea that these things happen to people. People need some support. So it's our job to make sure that we are um, not creating too many things that will confuse everybody. But the fact that there's this much, much attention, this much focus as a social worker who's been a social worker for a couple of decades now, it really feels like we're at a time that's, that people are really talking about this differently. Um, the stigma feels a little bit less, it's still there, but it feels different to me. And uh, certainly there's a high level of commitment um, in state government and the people represented here um, on this call that that just really gives me a lot of hope for the future. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. I can go next if that's okay with you. Um, to Emily's point, we are extremely dedicated to serve all Massachusetts residents. So as I mentioned before, and Emily pointed out the CBHC, Community Be About Center, and the helpline, um, these are non-insurance driven. Again, so any party can just call when there is a crisis, right? There's a, at times, and even including myself, when you go through the crisis and you feel flustered and um, and scared, right? Nervous about what's going to happen next. So instead of like worrying about your insurance card, any contact information, you can just call or even chat via website and then just getting help right away. I think that's really important. The other thing is a warm handoff um, and real life assessment and triage and pieces. And I mentioned in the previous uh, presentation is that and when we're um, in crisis, I feel, again, you're flustered, you're worrying about unknown factor, what's going to happen to my child or my family or my friends. And then um, you don't really have that frame of mindset to repeat, like, this is my information, this is my child information, this is crisis happening. Instead of doing that, helpline um, staff members are going to help with you, work with you. So provide information to our helpline, our next providers, but also follow-up steps, because we learn many, many times that when the crisis happens, let's say the client's going to the um, inpatient or hospital, I think once they get out of those um, hospitalization situation, at times we don't follow through uh, regarding the next um, mental health providers or um, the plan. I think that's where also helpline and community behavioral health center come in. So we want to make sure that our clients get right services, but also if the service is continuously happening, I think that's also important key piece. So um, warm handoffs and non-insurance driven services, we're connecting with all Massachusetts residents. Those are the really important pieces that we see. And as Emily mentioned, we would like to see that more and more, some more positive stories are coming. We're hoping to hear that more. And can I say with 988, I mean, uh, one of the biggest things that we have seen is a change is even just the collaborative approach that we have all taken in different state agencies to work together to make this happen. I think that's been incredibly powerful. It's not something that we have done over the years. And so, you know, I've just seen such a huge change over this past year in particular. And, and then also to um, another piece that I think has been that has worked extremely well you know, I mentioned the warm handoffs that call takers can provide for a caller who may need additional support. This is something they never could do before. They could give the number, you know, they could say, hey, if you need something, you know, you could call this number. But to actually be able to do a warm handoff for somebody makes a huge difference for that individual in that moment. And, you know, I, you know, we heard people talk about not wanting to repeat stories. To have that call taker say to that person they're doing a warm handoff, this is what's going on. This person really could use X, Y, and Z support. Um, this is what they've shared with me so far. Can you help them? And to be able to make that connection. You know, so I that is something our call takers have said. 
that's made a huge difference for them. They feel more comfortable as they're providing support for that caller. But in the same respect, respecting the caller and trying to give them the least invasive, you know, next step right, that, that intervention um, and really following the caller's lead. And I think that's what we need to do as a system is follow the caller's lead. They're the ones that are looking for us for support and how do we use that to be able to provide that? And if I can add as well, you know, in terms of least invasive resources, but also um, in informing the community ahead of time, because if, if for some reason someone might think something is invasive. So for example, uh, whether someone is says, oh, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with, with thoughts and feelings of suicide, but I don't want a significant change in my everyday life. But they know that like, for example, with the behavioral health helpline that, that they don't necessarily need to answer that question. You know, um, so, so for us at Kiva Centers, it's been important about informing that, that role as well to, to, to make it as consensual and as understanding as, as, as possible, you know, um, and, and I think having forums like this, where we are talking directly to the community as well has been very important. And if I could just throw in kind of what I'm hearing and seeing out in the community and what my team is hearing out and seeing out in the community is that uh, if, if hope is a snowball that helps us kind of get uh, unstuck from old ways of doing things and move increasingly and exponentially toward change, toward real culture shift with how we approach behavioral health and the Commonwealth, then we are a really awesome snowball <laughs> gathering right now. And that, and I'm just speaking anecdotally, right, from what I'm hearing and seeing and what my team is hearing and seeing. I'm thinking of, you know, two presentations in particular where I was talking with social workers explaining about the behavioral health helpline. And there were social workers in tears <laughs> saying, oh my goodness gracious, the people I serve have been needing this for so long and I'm just so thankful that it's available now. I, same thing at a, um, at a recent veteran services off, service, veterans services officers presentation, uh, the same kind of response. I mean, my own dad, <laughs> when I was explaining to him about the behavioral, behavioral health helpline, you know, and the challenges we've faced as a family, uh, it almost feels unreal that that um, these wide open front doors are, are available now. And of course, there are plenty of us who have been hurt or failed by, by the system when the system hasn't worked. Uh, behavioral health system hasn't worked the way it should have. So naturally, there, there are questions and, and um, folks kind of stepping forward gingerly with a, we'll, we'll see if this works. Um, but what's exciting is that it is working so far and, and we're seeing individuals uh, connected to care and getting, getting real help. So that's exciting. Thank you. And Becky, that's such a good transition to the next question, which is, you know, what challenges have you encountered with all of these changes that have been happening and going on? And as a second part, you know, considering those challenges, what would an ideal system look like to you? Where, where are we moving towards um, if, if we could um, in the future? I can go first. One of the big challenges that we're facing is workforce challenges. I'm sure it's a nationwide and everybody's going through it. So unfortunately the helpline team's going through as well. So due to difficult to find people with unique skill set um, required for all callers, such as engaging callers, assessing the situation need. I know Vesper, you mentioned about trauma, right? Trauma-informed approaches, how can we find the right services? And those skills are necessary. However, we're still struggling to find the people who's ready to become our awesome helpline uh, staff member, especially uh, licensed clinicians and also uh, peer specialists. So um, I would like to say the uh, workforce challenge is the number one so far. I will echo that with Julie. Um, that's definitely been a struggle and our centers have hired over 300 staff people. And this is something, you know, for, for any of us and, and, and I was trained on the helpline, you know how um, anxiety reading that can be even for the call taker, not just the caller, right? So how do we provide that support and, 
and um, and how do you find the right people? This isn't a call center like calling Wayfair or Amazon. This is somewhere where people are looking for emotional support. And you know, so I, I just also wanted to kind of add to that is that whenever something new is formed, there's always going to be hiccups and challenges. And we need to be patient with ourselves and say, we've put a good system in place and it's going to take a little time for us to get it just right. But in the meantime, to be able to talk to with one another and, and you know, Julie and Emily know we've we've definitely had conversations where maybe there has been a challenging call and maybe something didn't happen exactly the way it should. So what could we do different and and how can we inform and share that with one another? That's what we need to continue to do to really get the system to the place of where it should be. But it's going to take time. And sometimes that's really difficult for people who are in crisis and want need and want something right now. Um, but we're doing what we can. And, and, and so are those folks that we're hiring to be able to do that. I can add one more point if that's okay, Kelly. Thank you so much for pointing out the collaboration. It has been an amazingly exciting journey for DMA so we can connect with. Uh, 988, um, Emily's OBH team for CBHC folks, and also 211 and BSAF, um, Substance Addiction Services, Bureau of Substance Addiction Services, so, um, Substance Abuse Helpline. I think those are the, our key partner, but also the collaboration was really helpful. So at times, community member will say, what number am I supposed to call? So here is the answer. There are no wrong doors for our community members because we are working collaboratively behind the door, behind the scenes. So when the helpline receive a call regarding the caller wanting to connect with 988 because a person needed emotional support, there's a things that they would like to work on with the 988 team and that's not a problem we can connect directly to the 988 or it could be 211 uh, so there's a lot of collaborations happening and it's been extremely helpful i can add i mean i would say that uh voluntary trauma-informed consensual accessible treatment right um you know and I know that those are a lot of different words to say that the community should be informed and should be leading the efforts as much as they can in partnership with, with systems and, and, and entities, right? And ideally, when we look at the role of, of behavioral health and we look at access to treatment, we look at all of these things that, that how are we addressing these things sooner and sooner? Right, like, like, like when someone is struggling, and 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 that there's a commonality to the conversation of emotional distress and mental health, and what that looks like in the household, and what that looks like for the person without an inherent fear that something's going to happen to them. So, so I think I think for us, that's something that that we want to see. We see some of it happening now. Um, it, it's, it, it is great when we think about access to treatment, but sometimes there can be a, a rush to access to treatment where we are overlooking, you know, the voluntary community led piece. Um, so, so I think, I think thinking of the legacy of the Americans with Disabilities Act and Olmstead and the right to live in community. Um, and the last 35 years of work in terms of mental health advocacy and certified peer specialists, it's so, 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 so crucial that when we think about this future, that it is in the community as much as possible. Great, does anyone else have any other thoughts on uh, maybe the challenges that we're facing and, and what an ideal system could look like? The only thing I'll add is, um, I wish we could do it all at once right now, but we can't. So I think that these are exciting foundational building blocks based on, you know, a lot of people being really invested in identifying the problems and thinking about what the solutions can be, but we're not going to get it perfectly right. So I, I would suggest that we're going to continue to experience challenges and, and it's up to us. It's up to consumers, advocates, stakeholders, providers, and regulators to understand those as opportunities and not miss the opportunities. So that's all I'll say. In fact, you could just tag on to that to say that 
And that's another function of community relations team is to be listening deeply in the community to what the feedback is, to what the gaps are, so that we can bring those back to the team and figure out how we can do better. So when I envision kind of the ideal system, we're deeply connected and we're listening well and we're, we're responsive to each other. Great. And that just leads to the last question. I think a lot of people are going to want to know how they can be a support. So how can everyone listening here, how can advocates, um, the peer community, individuals with lived experience, how can they be a part of this process and help move our crisis system in the right direction? I want to jump in immediately because it's about life experience <laughs> and peer support communities. And uh, I think I think a way is, is 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 if you're someone with life experience that that does want to you know give back to your community in some type of way, it doesn't have to be in just a direct support capacity. One, the advocacy you are doing, the the ways you are trying to inform your community, that's an important role. So I think learning about these resources, attending things like this to inform your community is a great start. But I, I also think another piece is, is that if you did wanna work in a more direct role, we do have a certified peer specialist training. And then that is something that that we're, we are trying to, to emphasize in as many communities as possible. Because we, we find that a lot of black and brown communities um, in particular, you know, are often siloed off from mental health resources and mental health community support as much as possible. So for us, we have been going to the churches, the barber shops, the laundry mats, the, the immigration centers, the GED and high set centers, all of these different spaces in the community as much as possible to talk about the role of peer support in mental health, behavioral health, and certified peer specialists. And that this is a career path, right? You can you, you, you complete your high school education or you have a GED or a high set, you know, and and you could go into this role, right? It is it, it, it is it is an, an equitable and more accessible in a lot of ways role. And it can be an introduction point. If you don't want to work as a certified peer specialist, you could work in other roles. This is it, it, it can be a good starting point, you know, uh, for a lot of folks. And I think I think in, in, in order to get there, um, it, it, it takes a community to to really work at that and, and gain that idea. I think also um, having people with life experience inform research and policy change is huge. Um, I think, you know, we've been seeing this in more state commissions and more spaces where a person with life experience can be in that space. Um, and, 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 and I think that that's a great start because you will miss things if you haven't lived it yourself. If, if your family hasn't gone through it. So when we think about, again, that health equity approach, incorporating life experience as much as possible, thinking about community-based part participatory research and, and, and a lot of these elements is important too. Thank you, Vesper. Is there anyone else? Ellie? Sure. Um... Vesper, I so appreciate what you just said. You're like singing the singing, you know, public health and in, in what we really, you know, try to to bring out there. And this does have to be that combined approach, right? That has that kind of that public health lens on top of this behavioral health that we're really working on. Um, when I think of what we could use for support, it's really ensuring that the message being shared is accurate. There's so many, there's so much on the misinformation, which I, I said right at the beginning, whether it's about 911 with 988, or even uh, the fact that Massachusetts system looks different than it does in other states, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to work. And the fact that we're working so well collaboratively and really making sure that we're tying these pieces together, it's, it's the same system, right? And so I think it's, it, that piece can be really helpful for us and and really helping in moving our goal forward on the success of the system. And so that that's what I would come in with. Thank you, Kelly. And, Julie? And 
Yes, thank you. And we would love to hear um, you know, everybody's input and suggestions. And I only mentioned the word, this system's new and very complex system. Then, you know, ideally it's gonna work for everybody. However, we also know that there's going to be things that we have to improve daily. And that being said, we would love to hear from you. So please let us know. Um, I know that Emily will share the you know, contact information for the helpline team, Community BFL Center, 988A. And Vesper, I'm sure you're going to share your information too, right? But keep a center. So please let us know so we can, uh, we know that we're doing right, but also we know that we can improve the system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Becky? And just with that, I would add, if you, uh, you know, all, all of you, all of you NAMI folks know of any groups or individuals uh, that, that my team in particular could be reaching out to and connecting with, we would so appreciate you helping us uh, get connected with those individuals and groups and our contact information is on the slide that Jacqueline will be sharing. Hey, well, I guess that is it. Um, again, I've thanked you all so many times, but thank you for this very informative session. Um, we are going to now post some of the slides that we have been talking about with the contact information um, that Emily had provided. And Becky, are you okay with us resharing? Um, yes, great. Um, so we'll reshare that. And then I will also share my contact information as well um, as the Director of Policy Advocacy and Communications here at NAMI Mass. So if you need to reach out to me for any questions, you can do so as well. Um, thank you to all of our panelists having representation from DMH, Mass Health, Kiva Centers, MBHP, um, and DPH was a significantly important thing for us to do. And we very much appreciate this during our advocacy day. So thank you so much to all the panelists. And I hope everyone else will join us for our health mental health equity panel um, starting at 1.30 today. Thank you. Thank you.